about the short-term gyrations of the stock market or about a share price, nor because we're constituted as a trust operating within a clear statutory framework are we subject to the whims of a private owner. Coupled with the diversity of our portfolio and the quality of many of its underlying assets, we can afford to take a long-term view and to invest with a view to the long term. And all this undoubtedly gives us an advantage. But we also face a number of, our con a number of constraints which many of our, which many of our uh, competitors do not have to contend with. First and foremost, we have, to have no, we have no access to fresh equity. And furthermore, we're not allowed to borrow under the terms of our Act. This means we can't access capital for short-term tactical purposes, nor can we gear up to underpin long-term performance. This makes, makes us highly unusual as a business. Second, we're quite severely limited in law in what we can invest. We can only invest in UK real estate and in gilts. In fact, even within that remit, we are restricted in the ways we can gain access to the real estate market. For example, we can't invest in companies such as REITs, in derivatives, or indeed overseas. And unlike, for example, the duchies of Cornwall and Lancaster, with whom we have some similarities, we cannot hold an equity portfolio to help balance our overall financial performance. In other words, what it boils down to is that we stand or fall by our ability to make sound, direct real estate investments, to manage our assets effectively, and to be a good landlord and property manager. Our third constraint, because of our unusual status and our links with the monarchy and with government and parliament, uh, is that we do from time to time find ourselves subject to quite intense political scrutiny. Uh, as well as being chief executive, uh, I also rejoice under the title, a rather quaint title, of accounting officer. And I can and have been called to appear in front of parliamentary select committees. Not an experience, I have to say, for the faint-hearted. This adds an extra and at times quite challenging dimension to some of the more difficult decisions that we have to take. So against this background, how do we ensure that we optimise performance? How do we make the most of our innate advantages and mitigate the constraints within which we have to work? Well, first, like most other businesses, we need to have a clear vision setting out what we aspire to be, underpinned by a clear sense of our values, defining what we stand for. We've defined our vision as being to be the UK's most respected property business because of the commercial and sustainable way we manage a unique and diverse portfolio of assets. This vision seeks to capture the sense of the Crown Estate and the direction in which we wish to take it. We have three core values which underpin that vision, namely commercialism, integrity and stewardship. Now this isn't just motherhood and apple pie for us. First and foremost, we have a commercial mandate under the Crown Estate Act to deliver a return on our assets. In other words, to make a profit. Frankly, if we can't do this, we're dead in the water. Of course, every organisation would say that it behaves with integrity, and so, of course, do we. But the point for us here is that because of our links with monarchy, with government and parliament, there's a very strong expectation that we will always seek to do the right thing. As a result, we may not always be quite as sharp-elbowed as some other players, but the point is that we're in that place by choice, not through inertia or naivety. On stewardship, most businesses would of course say today that they embrace the highest standards of corporate responsibility, and again, so of course do we. But it has an added resonance for us. We're entrusted with a unique range of assets, which as well as having plenty of innate commercial opportunity, form part of the nation's heritage and fabric. Over 700 buildings in our portfolio have historic listed building status. I think that makes us more than any other landowner in the country on that score. On our rural and marine estates, we have over 1,600 sites of special scientific interest, which ha happens to include the whole of Windsor Great Park. And on our marine estate, we're responsible for a vital UK natural resource 
with myriad environmental sensitivities. So without wishing to sound too pompous or pious about it, we do have to be imbued, and we are imbued, with a real sense of a special responsibility for the assets which we manage. And what this means is that running the Crown Estate as a business is one where one is constantly striving to get the right balance. First and foremost, we must be commercial, but that must also be tempered with integrity at all times and a strong recognition of our stewardship responsibilities, which run right the way across all parts of the portfolio. Our vision and values provide a real framework for how we run the business. If you've been to our offices, you'll actually see the values are carved into the wall outside the lifts. But that's not sufficient. To actually make it happen, and in particular meet our commercial objectives, we need and have a well-considered investment strategy and the skills to implement and deliver it. That strategy acknowledges that we are not, nor do we have any ambition to be, a fully balanced fund. We are a supplier of real estate and associated services within certain sectors of the industry, with certain core assets and areas of activity which we regard as part of our DNA. Our strategy has two central themes to balance our exposure to our core areas of activity as efficiently as possible, and to provide sufficient working capital for the continued development of the business. We identify our core areas, those, those DNA items I mentioned, as the West End of London, in particular Regent Street and St. James's, our principal dominant retail holdings outside central London in locations such as Oxford and Exeter, our coastal and offshore marine holdings, and our rural estate. Within our urban portfolio, we're specialists in the West End, and I think we can stand comparison with any of the other London estates or listed operators. We plan to continue to exploit this area of competitive advantage by making the most of our high-quality portfolio and the experience and know-how of our staff to achieve continued outperformance. However, as recently as two years ago, our overall London holdings constituted some 80% of our urban portfolio, amounting to well over £3 billion of capital value. So whilst we continue to remain strongly committed to prime property in London's West End, we have been disposing of what, for us, are non-core central London holdings in locations like the City, Midtown and Kensington, where we haven't had major concentrations of assets or indeed of expertise. Alongside that, we've looked for ways to both reduce our exposure to our largest asset, Regent Street, and to supply vitally needed working capital for reinvestment back into the portfolio. With the recently agreed sale of a stake in Regent Street, we're within sight of both these goals and would expect our longer-term exposure to central London to be closer to 60%, which broadly is the level we currently consider appropriate for our kind of business. This reduction in our exposure to central London has included our recent deal with the Norwegian Government Pension Fund, of which you may have read reports in the press. Now, for us, this was a landmark deal on which we exchanged contracts in January, and I'd just like to say a few words about it. Our starting point in approaching this deal was the vital importance we attached to maintaining the key feature of our ownership of Regent Street, which has enabled us to improve it and to boost its performance over the last fair year, few years. And that key feature is the fact that the whole of the street is under our single ownership, enabling us to pursue a single vision and an integrated management strategy for the street as a whole. You only have to look at the state of Oxford Street, for example, to see what happens when you have fragmented ownership. Our deal with the Norwegians, therefore, provides that we retain the freehold ownership of the entire street and responsibility for its management, while the Norwegians take a layered 150-year lease across the whole of the street. Their lease is valued at 25% of its total value, giving them a corresponding share of the income and the Crown Estate a capital receipt of some £450 million. It was particularly important to us in selecting a partner for this arrangement that we found somebody who shared our views and va values and commitment to the long term. And in the Norwegians, we believe we have found just that, and we're very pleased with the outcome. 
Now, this reduction in our exposure to central London and given the rise...